Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular Continuing Medical Education Podcast. Join us each week to discuss the most pressing topics in cardiology and gain valuable insights that can be directly applied to your practice. Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Kopetsky, a preventive cardiologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. A great pleasure to be speaking with Dr. Vlad Vasily today, who is both has an appointment in the Department of Cardiovascular Diseases, in Preventive Cardiology, and in our Cardiovascular Lab. So welcome, Dr. Vasily. Thank you very much, Dr. Kopetsky. It's a pleasure for me to be here as well. So we'll be talking today about a, a molecule, an entity that's getting a lot of press, lipoprotein A. And you've studied this quite a bit, uh, Vlad. Why, why is, what is LPA and why is it not good for us? Um, Dr. Kopetsky, lipoprotein A is a um, circulating protein that associates with the cholesterol complex. It does comprise two particles. Uh, one is an LDL particle, LDL-like particle, or bad cholesterol-like particle. And the other one is apolipoprotein A, or simply called ApoA, uh, which wraps around the first particle. So uh, this is really the structure of uh, lipoprotein A. It is associated with increased atherosclerotic cardiovascular events in an independent manner, um, independent of the traditional uh, risk factors such as LDL, hypertension, smoking, uh, or diabetes. It ha has also been associated with valvular heart disease such as aortic stenosis. Studies have shown that approximately one in five people have elevated lipoprotein A. And these elevations have a strong genetic uh, component. And unfortunately, to date, we don't have any specific drugs that reduce levels or um, reduce levels and at the same time influence outcomes. So it, if I understand you then, uh, the lipoprotein protein A uh, will actually form plaque because it has an LDL molecule. It is a pro-inflammatory molecule also, is that, is that correct? That is correct. And is it a pro-clotting molecule? Lipopro one of the components of the lipoprotein A is, a very, is very similar with uh, uh, some clotting uh, factors, and therefore we believe that it also has uh, clotting properties. So that's so it's not good as you explained. It causes the plaque, it ruptures the plaque, and it clots at the rupture. So that uh, I can certainly understand. It's not so good. So do we have any drugs to treat lipoprotein A? Currently, we do not have any drugs that reduce the lipoprotein A and um, um, influence outcomes or reduce the bad outcomes. We do have some drugs um, that. Uh, reduce the level of lipoprotein A, such as niacin. Mm -hmm. Niacin is an older drug that uh, was uh, used uh, many years ago to reduce cholesterol. It has been associated with a lot of side effects. So mm -hmm. generally speaking, we needed to pre-treat these patients before we started uh, them on niacin, or every time they took niacin, they needed to be pre-treated. Mm -hmm. um, Additionally, some studies have shown that even if you reduce the lipoprotein A by niacin, you don't influence outcomes. Therefore, we believe that at this point, uh, we don't have sufficient evidence to use niacin in clinical practice to reduce lipoprotein A. Mm -hmm. Other more novel drugs such as PCSK9 inhibitors also uh, reduce the um, uh, lipoprotein A. However, we don't have data as far as outcomes. So again, uh, these have not made their way into uh, the guidelines, at least as of yet. Mm -hmm. And then the third uh, antilipid drug we use, statins. What do they do? It, uh, they raise it, they lower it, do they affect it at all? We know the statins don't really change the outcomes though. That is correct, and um, uh, I'm not aware of, uh, you know, there are some changes that I see with uh, initiation of statins in patients with elevated lipoprotein A, but um, our approach in treating elevated lipoprotein A is not really etiologic. We do not address the lipoprotein A. We, we don't attempt to decrease or uh, change the lipid profile uh, with statins. Mm -hmm. uh, rather, we address the patient from a very comprehensive perspective, very aggressively trying to uh, 
reduce all the risk factors for coronary artery disease. We treat blood pressure, um, uh, cholesterol, all those things. In addition to that, I recommend um, all to, the majority of the patients with elevated lipoprotein A to start a statin and also a baby aspirin, again, in an attempt mm -hmm. to reduce the overall uh, cardiovascular risk. Mm -hmm. And then what about lifestyle, you know, diet, activity? Do we know that benefits them and, or, and do you recommend it to patients? I absolutely recommend it to all of the patients that have elevated lipoprotein A, again, as an overall and comprehensive approach to reducing the uh, uh, coronary artery disease risk. Very good. Now, why do some people have high levels of LPA and others do not? Is it genetically transmitted? We believe that um, elevation in lipoprotein A has a very strong genetic component. Um, and um, therefore, um, every time I have a patient in the clinic that has elevated lipoprotein A, um, I always recommend that all first degree relatives be screened uh, for lipoprotein A because there is a very strong uh, genetic component. And what do we know about the genetics? Is it a dominant gene or, or how does it work? Uh, it is an uh, autosomal dominant gene, but generally we don't test for that uh, particular gene. So if you know the LPA level, you don't need to check the genetics? We don't need to check the genetics because it, it wouldn't influence what we do from the perspective of recommendations and interventions. Okay, very good. Now, you mentioned if you have a patient in clinic with a high LPA, what is the, what's the reason we would check an LPA in a patient anyway? This is a very good question because um, yeah, the uh, topic is uh, quite controversial. Uh, the uh, current uh, U.S. guidelines are uh, not very specific in this regards. If you look at the AHA ACC guidelines, they endorse lipoprotein A testing in patients with familial hypercholesterolemia with a, a 2A level of confidence. But if you look at other U.S. societal guidelines, they extend these recommendations. If you're peeking at uh, our colleague, uh, our cardiology colleagues uh, in, the, uh, in Europe, they recommend a universal testing of lipoprotein A as a one-time, lifetime testing in everybody. In my practice, I tend to uh, test uh, or, or follow the uh, European Society of Cardiology guidelines and test pretty much everybody uh, once for lipoprotein A because I think this is a, a condition that is often missed. Uh, in addition to uh, this screening approach, I also test lipoprotein A for patients that have or are suspicious of familial hypercholesterolemia uh, or patients that have atherosclerotic disease um, uh, or patients that had um, uh, a personal history or a family history of premature coronary artery disease. And when you do find a patient that has uh, early ASCBD, and you find they have a high LPA, what do you, do you give the patient a letter to give the family or do you call, call the family in or how do you manage that? Um, I generally call the patient and um, um, start some sort of interventions. Um, so one thing that is important to know about lipoprotein A is that the level is important. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a dose response effect, meaning that the higher the level of lipoprotein A, the higher the risk. And this has been recapitulated in many studies. Um, and so depending on the level of lipoprotein A, uh, I may be more aggressive with uh, my recommendations in addition to uh, the uh, lifestyle changes. I may recommend um, uh, a moderate or a higher intensity statin. Mm -hmm. And so I want to discuss with the patient all these uh, things over the phone rather than simply communicating because it's not just a simple result of a blood test. It, it has many implications for the patient and for the, their, their first degree relative. So I prefer to call the patient and have a conversation over the phone. Very good, Dr. Vasily. Now, is, if you have two patients, A and B, that aren't related and they both have a high LPA, is their risk the same? Or is there a difference in LPA in different people? Um, there are certain studies that suggest that uh, we should also look at the particle size for lipoprotein A because there may be differences in um, uh, 
uh, in risk depending on the size of these particles. However, mm -hmm. I think these uh, studies need more refinement. We actually need more studies to draw a, a definitive conclusion from that perspective. And um, at least at Mayo Clinic currently, we do not offer this as a, a routine testing. Very good. Well, this is a fascinating uh, discussion, Dr. Vasily, about live protein A, and, and great, it's great to hear you say that you check it very frequently in people with early ASCVD or in families that may have it. it helps you with valve disease, uh, aortic stenosis. Uh, the, uh, it's, and it's a molecule it sounds like we'll hear more and more about as drugs may come along to treat it since we have no treatment now. Any final words, Dr. Vasily? No, I think uh, one um, uh, uh, recommendation that I would give to all my uh, cardiology colleagues who are taking care of uh, patients in um, uh, the preventive clinic, for example, is to not miss screening for lipoprotein A. Um, I see this over and over. Um, I see patients in the clinic and I see patients uh, in the hospital setting that have elevated lipoprotein A and this has been uh, missed for, for many years. Um, another thing that I think it is important for us cardiologists not to forget is that once you identified an elevation in lipoprotein A, um, uh, we should be very aggressive about screening all first degree relatives. Because again, this is a, a thing that is, uh, can be uh, easily missed and, and in this way we can miss patients. Even if we can't treat it, it's good to know the risk. If their risk is increased, there's other things they can do. Well, fascinating discussion, Dr. Vasily. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Kopeski. I appreciate being here. Thank you for joining us today. Feel free to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast by emailing cvselfstudy at mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular CME podcast on your favorite platform and tune in each week to explore today's most pressing cardiology topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic.